being here in the Yukon and having dogs is a part of nature. On the road, we see caribou, lynxes, rabbits. There's everything here. That's why we're here, those who live in the north. It's because we have very, very close bonds with the animals. We love having them around us. Peter Ledwidge has always been attracted by adventure in the wilderness. A prospector at heart, this geologist discovered the Yukon at age 20. It was love at first sight. In Dawson City, he met his wife Anne, also a geologist. Good morning, guys! The proximity of wildlife and the great outdoors so enchanted them that they decided to live close to the legendary town. Well, you didn't even go racing. You didn't even go racing. No running away, Orby. Later on, with the small bundles of money, we bought a house where we could have dogs outside of Dawson, here. Then we began picking up dogs. We started off with five, and at present, we have 35. Sled dogs are part of the history of the Yukon. During the gold rush, dog sledding was the only way used to move goods in winter. Dog races quickly became very popular. Nowadays, the Yukon boasts an average of twice as many dogs as inhabitants, and several major competitions take place in the territory. The first team I saw, I looked at my friend and said, I want to do that. Since then, it has been the focus of my life. Now the whole family does it. Myself and then Anne and our daughter Emily. And Mark likes to go with us on the ski -doo. It's not that he doesn't like dogs. He doesn't like not being in control. And with the dogs, you're not always in control. Beautiful day in paradise. It's not a hobby, it's not a pastime, it's a way of life. It's all consuming and sometimes, well, it destroys relationships. The training and care required to keep the animals in good physical shape keeps the Ledwidge family busy 365 days a year. Today, Peter is preparing for the Percy DeWolf race, a commemorative race in honor of an extraordinary character who delivered the mail between the Yukon and Alaska for close to 40 years. This is Percy. He's one of our best lead dogs. With all his training and everything, this dog must have run something like 30,000 kilometers. And he's always ready to run more. <laughs> Peter knows the character of each of his dogs intimately. He chooses his lead dogs according to their capacities. Some are stronger, some more obedient or faster. To avoid any psychological stress, Peter rotates his lead dogs during training and races. They're like human beings. They're all different. People often ask us, how do you remember all their names? Well, it's like a teacher at school. She remembers all the names of the children she teaches. And it's the same for us. Each pupil is different, and you should treat them differently. Peter and Anne have been breeding dogs for around 15 years now. Their daughter Emily helps them to look after them day to day, and even takes part in races for juniors. We've learned from all the dogs that we're born at home. Obviously, you have them from being puppies. There's a bond with them that lasts forever. a really close rapport with all of his dogs. He knows them individually, he knows them well. Like, if you're gonna do well at mushing, and you're gonna keep mushing, you have to have a, a pretty high standard of care for your animals, otherwise you're just not gonna go anywhere. 
And the dogs will quit on you if you're not, if they're not being taken care of properly. John Overell has been a veterinary surgeon in Dawson City since 1998. A sled dog specialist, he regularly volunteers as the official vet in competitions. He will be the officiating vet in the Percy DeWolf race. At Peter's request, he has come to check that his dogs have no health problems that might have escaped his vigilance. Did you want to check some of my dogs? Well, well, look at it and see how, what you think it's like. And if you think there's any danger, I don't want to risk it. Like. The race takes place tomorrow. The warmer temperature is worrying John and Peter because it might affect the dog's stamina. Peter is also bothered by a back injury that he suffered in training last autumn. The injury could flare up at any moment and put an end to his race. Some are here to win, and for some the goal is just to finish. I'm in the special position of having two goals. I hope my back will allow me to finish, and if it does, then I hope to win. For Peter, this race is special because it'll be his last. In just a few months, this family of geologists will go to live in Australia for a year in search of other deposits. So tomorrow morning, I'll be a little nervous, that's for sure, because of the worries I have. But I'll try not to communicate that to the dogs because, well, they know when you're emotional. So I'll have to keep my self-control for the dog's sake. The great day has arrived. In the Ledwidge house, there's a certain excitement. Anne is helping Peter prepare for two days intensive racing. Anne? Yeah. Remind me to keep one of those pills, okay, like before I leave. I hope it'll go well. We'll see. My fears, either that I have trouble with my back and begin to get back cramps or that I'm totally incapable of walking. Those are my fears. My hope is to win it again. As long as I enjoy it, well, that's all that matters, as it's my last race. So, for me, it's a farewell to racing. That's a bit hard. It's like a final journey. The Percy DeWolf Memorial Mail Race is a 200-mile event, 320 kilometers, between Dawson in the Yukon and Eagle in Alaska. At the start of the race, there is so much energy. It's everyone is excited. The dogs are excited and going crazy, and everybody's, you know, getting getting ready. So it's uh, there's not much time to get ready. For the 16 competitors, it is vital to be ready in time, as the departures happen one after the other in two-minute intervals. If a musher isn't ready for the off, he'll leave last. The mailman is waiting, mailbag in hand, and the bag is given to the first competitor who must carry it to Alaska. Officially, the race begins at 10 o'clock, but there's a minute's pause to commemorate the work accomplished by Percy DeWolf. So the first competitor leaves at two minutes past 10. In front of the post office, you could cut the tension with a knife. The dogs have only one thing on their mind, running. I've had people come up to the Percy beginning and they're not sure whether they think it's a good sport or not. I usually send them to the beginning of a race and then ask them, do those dogs want to go racing or not? And the dogs make the answer. Peter got off to the start, well, I just make sure he gets around the, that first corner because <laughs> it's, uh, you know, two blocks down with a fresh dog team and you have to make a 90-degree turn. It's, 
that, I don't know, if that for me is the worst part of the whole race, <laughs> is making that corner. You know, the rest of the 209 and miles are, are easy compared to that, I think. The mushers are really good because they're connected to their animals. And there's a lot of, of musher stories about, you know, forgetting to put a tug line on and the dog keeps looking back. And then the musher realizes that the dog's telling him, you didn't hook me up properly. So there's definitely a lot of communication going on between, between them. And I always say that the, the dog team starts at the lead dog, but finishes after the musher, because they're all a team together, so. The way they communicate is pretty physical. And that's what I do when I communicate with them. I have a fairly high voice when I say, hey, hi, Sharky. But if they fight, I'll scold them in a very deep voice, as they do between themselves. Often, I sit down and watch their interaction. And that, that teaches me how to communicate with them. Peter and his dogs have been racing along the Yukon River for almost five hours. A quarter of the way along the route, the participants stop at 40 mile. John is there to ensure that the dogs are in good shape. Mushers are very aware of their dogs, and they can pick up very tiny things just from being on the back of the sled. If a musher says a dog is off, but he doesn't know exactly what it is, I'll try to find out what it is. But the mushers know the, their personalities of their dogs so well that he's just not being himself. You don't have to stop. There's no mandatory stops. Temperature is going to be a concern on this race. I think when the dogs are happiest, it's a little bit colder than when the mushers are happiest. <laughs> but um, like 20 below to 30 below is, is good temperature for them to run. They like, because they, they're generating a lot of heat and they can get rid of it easily. When a dog is injured or too tired, the musher can leave it at the checkpoint where it can be cared for. He'll then pick up the dog on the way back. The dog could then slot back into the team or be carried on the sled. Competitors must finish the race and bring all the dogs back in good health. Otherwise, they might be disqualified. Yeah. So, hey, Peter. Anybody you need to look at? Or are they all looking good? Peter has arrived among the leaders. His back is holding up well, at least for now, as are his dogs. It's going well now. The dogs are running well. It's starting to get warm. That's why I'm giving them water with meat in it. Well, that I prepare each time before we set off. You can push yourself as hard as you want. You know, I've seen mushers come in absolutely exhausted from, you know, running along beside their sled or pushing up the hills or, you know, they're not taking care of themselves, they're not hydrated, they're not drinking enough or eating enough, but the dogs are fine. Actually, that happened to Peter on one race, and he came in and he was almost hypothermic, and his he had worked so hard getting his dogs up and over this one summit, and he was so worried about them that he didn't even care about himself. And the vet took one look at him and, and she said, those dogs are fine and we gotta take care of Peter. We gotta get some fluids in him and make sure he gets warm and dried out. So she was actually way more worried about him than, than about the dogs at that point. Peter and his dogs are off for another six hours on the Yukon River. Next stop, Eagle in Alaska. The participants will run until nightfall before reaching the place where they can sleep. 
Often, when he races across snow-covered paths, Peter recalls the many expeditions spent with his dogs, contemplating magnificent scenery and living in harmony with nature. We travel through the wilderness. We see wolves, we see moose, we see everything. I imagine it's like, like sailing. These dogs are like the sails, except they give you cuddles and, well, they're nice, whereas a sail can't talk. <laughs> it's the idea of traveling in a total, totally natural and very ancient way. It's like a journey into the past. It happens, well, just like it did a hundred years ago. In Eagle, only half the competitors will have a bed. The others will have to make do with a place on the floor. For Peter, a bed means a few hours of rest for his long-suffering back. It could mean the difference between finishing the race and having to give up before the end. Peter made his mandatory six-hour stop in Eagle. Before retiring to bed, he took care of his dogs. In the end, he only managed a meager three hours sleep. A little before four in the morning, he was already back on the trail, well before sunrise. All night they were running really fast. And then soon as the sun came up, you could feel the speedometer falling. The higher the sun climbs, the lower your speed. The course isn't restful for the mushers or the dogs. They have to avoid the piles of crushed ice, the black ice, and the spots where the current is too strong for the water to freeze. When I was coming down, well, I fell on the bush trail, and then there were all these trees around me. You get your strength back right after you finish panicking. You check and see if your body's okay and make sure your back and legs are okay too. After this fall, Peter checks that his dogs haven't been hurt and concentrates on the remaining kilometers between him and Dawson. In Dawson, the firehouse siren rings out to announce the arrival of the first competitor. Peter's family impatiently await the arrival of competitor number seven. I need your binoculars, John. I don't know. That's not. For Anne and Emily, the wait seems endless. Did Peter give up? Yeah, I think that is number seven. He's just crossing the ice bridge now. Peter has finished in sixth place. In 2004, he won the race. But today, given the circumstances, he's happy to have finished with all his dogs in good condition. It's over, my last race of the year, at any rate. For at least, well, a year. You never know. When I get back from Australia, you never know. But in any case, my dogs were great. That was the last race for the Ledwich family. In a few weeks, Peter and Anne will go to live in Australia for a year to work at their profession as geologists. 
First of all, we chose Australia because of the wildlife. It's different. And, of course, we're interested in animals. The penguin family. <laughs> Emily loves penguins. Apparently, there's an island not too far from the Australian coast where we can see penguins. When they go to live in Australia, the Ledwidges must get rid of their dogs. I've been trying not to think about uh, the dogs and, and selling, you know, most of them. It's, it's going to be really hard. Um, they've been such a part of our life for, for so long. Sorry. <laughs> After a few days of thinking, Peter and Anne faced the facts. It was quite simply unthinkable to abandon all their dogs. They kept 18 and entrusted them to a musher with a reputation for taking care of his animals. Let's go, guys! Yeah. Emily is particularly glad at this decision, because when she's 18, she already wants to compete in the Yukon Quest reputedly the toughest race in the world. Well, Emily's interested in, in the dogs now. I mean, you know, kids, kids change their ideas, so you never know. You know, she wants to do the quest in eight years from now. It's uh, like she's talking about. You know, I think that's why we're not selling all the dogs. We have to keep some, because uh, we wouldn't be happy without any dogs and neither would she. When I'm in Dawson, I can't imagine not having any dogs because, well, that's my reason for being here. I, I love the Yukon anyway, but I wouldn't spend the winter here if I, I didn't have any dogs. As long as I'm here in the Yukon, I'll have dogs. I'll always have my dogs. Great purse. <laughs> 